Here's a thought. What could be worse than at the end of a fairly uneventful, elegant phaco emulsification, you end up injecting the IOL only to find that upon the completion of the injection, its trailing haptic is missing. Now this becomes a real problem because you can't really leave the IOL like this with a broken haptic in the eye. The reason for this is clearly obvious. An IOL with unequal lengths of haptics, that is, an IOL with one of the haptics shorter is unlikely to center well, whether placed in the back or in the ciliary sulcus. It is almost certain to decenter, resulting in a decentered IOL, which is going to cause significant visual symptoms because of the induced coma. The only condition wherein you could leave the IOL in situ is if you were to leave the haptics in the sulcus, one of a normal length and one clearly shorter, and manage to perform a posterior optic capture. A successfully performed posterior optic capture will hold the IOL well centered despite asymmetric haptics. Then and only then is it safe to leave the IOL in the eye. If that is not an option, it becomes clearly obvious that you do need to explant this lens. Now, explanting an IOL comes with its own challenges. And these are all the considerations that I would like to discuss. Now, monofocal IOLs, either hydrophilic or hydrophobic, are fairly rigid. Clearly, there is a significant discrepancy between the overall diameter of the IOL and the size of the incision. So we do have an IOL that needs to be either broken down and brought out of the incision or have the incision enlarged. Now the intraocular manipulations are likely to be significant, which increases the potential for intraocular damage to both the endothelium, the iris, as well as the posterior capsule and the angle of the eye. It's also important to be mindful of the fact that we have such limited experience in explanting an IOL. Having said that, every surgeon should be equipped with the surgical know-how of how to explant an IOL. Having considered all this, we now come to the point of discussing what therefore is the simplest, safest, easiest and easy to learn technique of explanting an IOL. Let's now move to the surgery where I can demonstrate to you what I think really works. In this patient, at the end of an uneventful phaco emulsification, we proceeded to implant the IOL. At the end of the IOL implantation, here's what we found. The trailing haptic was broken and almost two thirds of the trailing haptic was missing. We now proceeded to explanting the IOL. I'll now describe to you the simple technique of doing so. The 2.8 incision is now enlarged to a 5.2 mm incision using a 5.2 mm keratome. This is demonstrated here. Now, be mindful of the fact that now your incision is 5.2 mm, but the IOL optic has an overall diameter of 6 mm. There still remains a 0.8 mm discrepancy in the size of the IOL and the optic. So, there still is going to need to be a slight bit of force that needs to be exerted to explant the IOL through this incision without damaging it. My first attempt at trying to remove the IOL fails and here's why. Please note how I hold the IOL optic haptic junction very proximally and I'm trying to hold on to the lens and bring it out of the eye. Clearly, I'm not able to exert the correct amount of force that would be required to pull this optic out of this 5.2 mm incision. So here's the correct way of doing it. Under adequate viscoelastic, a well-opposed McPherson's is introduced into the eye, but make sure that, that the McPherson's holds on to a large portion of the optic. Only then would you be able to exert the correct amount of force while holding on to the body of the optic to be able to successfully and comfortably remove it out of the eye. Once the IOL is explanted, it's important to look for any signs of significant damage in the eye. Look at the corneal endothelium, look at the iris and ensure that there is no damage to the posterior capsule.
Having ensured the above, you can then proceed to implanting the other IOL into the eye safely within the capsular bag. In order to do so, we first insufflate the anterior chamber and the capsular bag with viscoelastic. We now proceed to the IOL insertion. At this point, I'd like to address why is it that the haptic ends up breaking? Now, while loading the IOL, we've got to be extremely careful that not only is the optic well within the cartridge, we need to ensure that neither of the haptics gets trapped prior to closing it. So in order to do so, we need to ensure that one, the leading haptic is well within the nozzle beyond the part of the cartridge that closes. And I always make it a point that I take the trailing haptic, lift it up and fold it within the body of the optic prior to closing the cartridge. In this manner, I'm able to almost always avoid any accidental trapping of the trailing haptic between the plunger and the cartridge wall. The other thing I do to just check and ensure that it is not accidentally trapped is that when I bring the IOL up to the tip, I always do so under the microscope under direct visualization. And upon bringing the IOL up to the tip, I always withdraw the plunger only slightly to ensure that the plunger moves away comfortably and that there is no trapped haptic between the plunger and the cartridge. Should we have an accidental trapping of the haptic, the plunger will not withdraw back easily. In fact, when you try to withdraw this plunger, the entire IR will try to move behind and you'll find a significant resistance in doing so. Now, once you've ensured that there is no trapping of the haptic, it is now safe to inject the IOL. Let's move back to this case. Now, remember that if you are injecting a foldable IOL and you choose to inject it after loading the IOL, you have a significant discrepancy between the size of the incision and the injector tip. So while injecting, be careful. You don't accidentally introduce the cartridge well into the eye because that can damage the capsular bag and the posterior capsule. So maintain your cartridge tip at the incision itself and inject slowly and cautiously. The second point to be remembered is that since there is such a discrepancy between the size of the cartridge and the incision, you're likely to lose viscoelastic. So it might be a good idea to use a cohesive viscoelastic in order to inject an IOL in this situation. Now having injected the IOL, the trailing haptic is introduced into the capsular bag and then we proceed to removal of the excess viscoelastic. Now because in this case there is a possibility of a significant leakage of the fluid through this large incision, I tend to hydrate the incisions, that is the main incision, prior to removing the viscoelastic. Following the completion of the viscoelastic removal, I now proceed to hydrate the incisions and note that this is adequate. And this brings us to the end of the case. It is not required to suture this 5.2 mm incision. A well-constructed 5.2 mm incision remains watertight, is safe, stable and secure and does not induce a significant postoperative corneal astigmatism. With this, I come to the end of the tutorial and I do hope you found it useful. Thank you.